designed the solar and federal power tricycle power design project by the way my name is David Lambert. I'm Irvin Alexander. Timothy Matthews. In this presentation, we will see our private statement requirements, time schedule, constraints, research, brainstorming ideas, brainstorming sketches, refinement of ideas, physical specification, material selection, and material problems. The problem statement. The project for our group is designed a solar tripod signal that also has to be pedal power. The tricycle should be able to fit two packages and be comfortable for normal use. Requirements. The requirements for our solar power tricycle is that it has to be solar power, it has to be pedal power, and solar power is not used. It must be able to carry two passengers comfortably. The solar panels are needed as well as the motor. Also, it has to have a gearbox. It has to be durable, cost efficient, and lightweight. This is just a timeline of what we did. timeline of uh, group tags and what, what's done by each other individual person. This is timeline continuing. The constraints was a solar panel that does not consume too much space. We had to hold two passages consistent of 200 pounds. The budget, the construction of the solar and federal power, and the uh, the motor that has to be strong enough to pull that weight. The way solar energy works is the sun hits the solar panel and that energy is turned into the electric current which is connected to the battery. And that electric current charges the batteries and the battery is used to uh, turn the motor. And this is just an image of how the solar energy works. And this was some of the research we did on the hub motor. When we were doing our research, there's actually more motors than this that we researched, but the hub motor is the one that would be the most efficient on our tricycle. The hub motor is basically an electric motor that is incorporated directly onto the hub, and as it spins, it, it turns the whole tricycle, it turns the motor. And this one, this was one of the cars that we researched that's being, industri that's being made in industry currently. This one's being made in Europe, it's an F car, and the two wheels are in the front, and it's a back wheel in the back. These two are other um, designs that we noticed when we were doing our research on tricycles that have solar power. This one's solar power, and this one's solar power, and it has, the solar power cools, uses the, what do you call it? The freezer. It powers the freezer so this man can go around and so ice cream on his tricycle. And this one, this was used in New York, more say, you see the wheel in the back and the two in the front. And his solar panel follows his local, local lead. Two more designs, as you can see, one you, is just pitch one passenger. The other it has a cabin back, which somewhat we made ours to mimic. Some of the brainstorming ideas, we had two wheels in the front, two wheels in the back, solar power without a battery, solar power with a battery, uh, have a cab mounted to the tricycle, which we, we have done. Uh, the solar panel is going to be elevated and it's mounted on the back. In this sketch, this is from our brainstorming sketches, and this one is Basically, it plays with the real places, three tires. This top design, you have three wheels aligned, and you see the two seats for the passenger. This is before the cab was added. In this middle view, you see it's a tricycle, and it has two wheels at the back, one to the front. And for this, oh, and for the, the solar panel placement, I had it under the bars, but it wouldn't get that light. It was brainstorming. For the solar panel placement on this third 
idea. It was a seat, but it wouldn't give me a sun with passage on top of it. This was actually another one of my ideas. We had the cabinet at the back, like we have it, but instead we had one wheel at the back and two wheels in the front. And we had a two seater where you could, each rider could pedal simultaneously. And this one, this one's similar to the design that we actually made. We had a cab in the back with the two wheels in the back. And uh, yeah, with the two wheels in the back. And this is the design of the cab. And then this one, this one's a different design. You have the two wheels in the front and the passenger pedal from the back with the one wheel behind, kind of like one wheel.
And as you see in our demo, our back right wheel was starting to wobble. So I went and I cut that off and I reloaded another load and that was bigger. The bigger spoke so when he moves his feet out, he's using electric power. It's causing the axle to bend, bend in a little bit, which puts more force on our wheels. We weren't able to get wheels with bigger spokes to withstand more pressure, so that's why we use the wheels that we use. So to correct that, yes, we can take another bar and run it to the axle and divide the forces upon the axle. We can redesign our axle, our axle actually create a different axle that's more turn friendly because the one we have, since it's welded together, it turns, but the turns are wide. They're not really, really wide, but they're wide. We can also use a lighter material to build the cab. This will reduce the stress on the, on the tricycle, increase the speed. We can increase the length of the cables from our solar panel because they're not long enough. So we have to elevate, we have to we put a crate on the back of our cab to elevate the batteries up so we can reach the clamp. And we could close the back end so nothing will fall out when you're reaching higher speeds in our tractor. For the marketing, it would be to attract people with disabilities. Say if they couldn't get around, they could always use a solar panel. And children of, that may be between the ages of seven, eight to 17, because they can't drive yet. So this would be a meaningful way for them to get around instead of walking in the heat having to wait on buses, things like that. Another thing I said that was difficult was getting the things that we needed, per se, going to different companies, going to different meetings, going and giving people brochures, trying to get them to see what you see in your project so they can give you the means to do the things that you can. Because we didn't get everything that we originally designed for, so that's why in some, some instances we work with what we had. That's why the, our back wheel started buckling. 
So we had to actually go back and re-weld and just, it made it more efficient. Design project, it's actually a lighter than air UAV project. Uh, my name's Greg Sanders. My name's Kirkman P. Brianna Porter. And I'm Miles Wolf. Our table of contents is we're going to go through our purpose, our objective, our UAV requirements, our timeline, we're going to do some background on military and surveillance. We're going to do our proposed ideas, design, and we'll go over our propulsion system, our control system, and our summary. And then our reference. The purpose of this project was to design an unmanned air vehicle to carry a cargo and through two gates carry a payload and return it to its original position. Uh, the objective of this project is to design the propulsion and control system for the UAV. Um, the US, UAV must be all ASME design requirements. UAV design requirements are powered by batteries, wireless transmitter, and receiver. Commercially available, <coughs> must be controlled completely via radio, controlled by one team member, emergency set off switch. This is our timeline for uh, this semester. Um, last semester we did most of our background research and uh, the initial design of our prototype. Um, this semester we did some refinement on our proposal of uh, the material selection part at the early beginning of the semester here. Uh, the search for sponsors uh, weren't too successful with that. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, we finalized our design, ordered our components, uh, constructed our prototype, and throughout the semester we're working on our final report and our presentation. Key personnel. <clears throat> All members were involved in proper identification, preliminary ideas, and key decision and manufacturing process. Gregory. Uh, I was the team leader. Uh, I'm responsible for the Gantt chart, physical specifications, and the technical approach. Also, uh, helping out with constructing the common program. I was responsible for most of the calculations, uh, some research, and the material selection. I was responsible for drafting and legending. I was responsible for constraints, assisting the research and drafting. Types of UAVs that we looked into, um, um, a few of them are the high altitude, the medium, the small, vertical, combat, those just here. Here's just some photos of some uh, different UAVs that are on the market. Uh, the top left of the sea is what is usually used for military uses as a camera mount on the front. Um, it's probably what most of y'all are familiar with seeing. Uh, to the top right there, we have a quad copter. Uh, then we have a basic helicopter design here for counter mount, mount on it, and we also have a design. The UAV that is most well known is the Predator, a fixed wing propelled driven remote control airplane. Uh, with the technology boom in the 90s, UAVs began to change from some might call expensive and marginally useful to weapons of war that are on, <coughs> on the right. A rotor wing vehicle has the ability to take off and land vertically. That's uh, pretty much just describing helicopters and quadcopters taking off and landing vertically. Uh, as the technology of UAVs have continued to evolve, military scientists, and strategists, and planners have found new roles for UAVs. Uh, another comment on that is, uh, Early use of UAVs were blimps or like air balloons. They would put incendiary bombs and try to float it over to enemy camps, but it wasn't very successful because they couldn't control it. Uh, military drones are mostly used for targeting, uh, for targeting missile strikes and some reconnaissance and civilians. They were first used in World War II. Uh, MQ-9 Reapers. Uh, are used by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, on May 18, 2006, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, the FFA, uh, FAA, issued a certif certificate, uh, certificate of authorization which allowed the MRQ-1 and MRQ-9 aircraft to be within U.S. civilian airspace. Uh, you may have seen some, not with this exact 
UAV, but there was some controversy uh, I last semester in Colorado where uh, government agencies were using UAVs and hunters were actually shooting them down. So it's going to become more common to see UAVs inside of civilian airspace. And that's the certificate that proved that there. These are some of our initial proposed ideas um, that we first started off with, um, along with CAD drawings with them. We had many ideas for the design, ranging from blimps to blades to just a basic helicopter design. The final design that we done along was a simple helicopter design, just out of ease to build and cost efficiency. This design was chosen to, to be apple example <clears throat> we found for this design as well as the fact that the parts for this design are readily available and reasonably affordable. We have calculated our power needed, velocity, annual velocity, and much more to determine the order size and order and the world power needed to rate. We also rolled out the uh, blimp design. We didn't feel it would be you'd be able to control it but it would be too slow for the uh, needs that we were trying to meet. Um, also the quadcopter, we thought it would be a little more in-depth having four motors, four blades spinning, and trying to calculate to get each one of them to run the same to oppose each other so we didn't have something just going around in circles. This is our prototype in CAD drawing of what our uh, top we have some of the equations we used, um, some of the velocity, the velocity uh, power equations, and uh, coefficients for angular velocity, and uh, rise for some other things like that. Uh, for our propulsion system, we went to a 11.1 volt, uh, 2200 milliamp hour battery. Um, this battery, with our design, max run time is about 10 minutes. Um, from talking to some uh, other flyers in the field, they say it's good to run it for only about five to six minutes because if you drain the battery too low, it actually won't recharge again. You have to go buy another battery, which costs more money. Um, for the motor itself, we used a 4200 kilovolt uh, motor. It's at 46,000 RPMs. It's got a uh, we used a 9 tooth pinion gear on that. And, uh, we calculated that using. Some equations from machine design class. Uh, that's actually turning a 140 gear, uh, tooth gear that turns our main blade. For the uh, gear, this is the top gear here, which is 140 teeth. The one underneath is actually 70. Now these are uh, locked together on the shaft, so they spin with each other. This gear here will actually spin another smaller pinion gear back here, which moves our tail rotor, so it spins at about half the RPMs as our main rotor. And uh, what that does is it counteracts when this rotor is spinning, it wants to twist the helicopter and just counteracts that by pulling back. And it also allows you to swing the back end around, depending on where you want to go. Uh, for the main rotor, we used, at first we'd, uh, we'd gone with this here, it's a carbon blade, carbon composite. We found after testing that it's actually too light. We're having control issues when we're trying to fly. So we ended up having to buy a heavier carbon fiber blade. Um, same length that helped us a little bit with the control issues that we were experiencing. And then for the tail rotor, we went with a uh, carbon fiber tail rotor. It's a 6.1 inch um, remote control that we purchased. Uh, this is uh, good for about 800 feet out. Anything over that is going to depend on your transmitter that you have or your uh, receiver that you have here. Different receivers can go to further lengths. Um, ours is about 800. And the receiver that we chose, it's a Spectrum. RA7200 and uh, it actually has a built in 3D gyro. And this is uh, some new technology that's on the market right now. What it does is, like today, if you notice, it's a little bit windy. When you're flying this, the wind will take control because it's very light. And it actually corrects itself to the wind. So if it starts to tilt, it'll actually automatically tell itself to tilt back. And that'll send a signal to your servers that'll pull your blades back so you don't go off course and uh, crash your helicopter. Um, this was our initial cost objective. We basically just took all the parts that we needed and um, did a price analysis on all of them. 
to where we came up with, we would separately purchasing parts, we would come up with a total cost of fifteen hundred dollars. Um, this is basically just a make breakdown of everything we needed um, from the battery, the motor, um, all of our servos. We needed three, and um, they handheld the transmitter. Um, after doing this um, cost analysis, we came up with a budget of $800. And after evaluating all the necessary products and their costs, um, we tried to cut the prices, but we'll get to that later. Um, the material selection part, you know, first we saw the motor blades, uh, the functions we were looking for, the must be able to stand for stress and strength. Uh, high, high velocity of RPMs and the lift was produced by that. Uh, they must weigh less than 50 grams total. Both plates, uh, total length must be around 0.71 meters and we didn't want to cost any more than $50. Um, we used this chart to uh, initially find out which materials would probably be best for our blades. This right here is our uh, properties. We went with carbon fiber and glass fiber. Uh, this is our Young's modulus, our ultimate tensile stress, the density for these materials, the specific stiffness, and the uh, specific strengths for these. Um, we went with these materials mostly because they're the most common for these types of UAVs, and more vendors have these. Um, I saw a few wood blades and some metal blades, but they're not as common. This is the strain analysis, I mean stress analysis I did for each of all three blades. Oh, sorry, this is the cost actually. Uh, we got the uh, weight and cost, thickness and the length and width. This is the stress analysis, uh, strain analysis, the elongation, how much it bends and how much it will bend certain forces in it. This is the uh, moment of inertia and the flat wire spin stiffness. Uh, after analysis, we came to the conclusion that all three blades that we had to choose from met our stress and strain requirements, so we went towards look more for the cost. We initially decided to go with fiberglass main rotor blades because of the cheapness, but when we actually went to buy the uh, fiberglass blades, we couldn't find any. Uh, and the only ones I think we could find were some that were in China. Like a week to get here, so we went with some carbon fiber, carbon fiber rotor blades as our second choice. Uh, for the frame, we just want something that uh, didn't cost too much, you know, would be able to withstand stresses, didn't weigh too much, and must be compatible with the uh, parts we plan on installing, like our gears, our servos, and stuff like that. Uh, unlike with our rotor blade, there was not much calculations with this. We just had to have something that fit with the gears and all the stuff, servos and stuff that we needed. And we ended up buying a kit that cost around $550 for our, for our frame and stuff like that. This, is what we uh, this was our final cost so after purchasing everything um, from the receiver all the way down to the frame. And we came up with a total of $900 and $900. That was spent. Uh, these are two pictures we have here. This is the picture of our uh, propulsion system. Um, the belt there is actually for the tail rotor. Um, it's, and it's inside of this tube to keep it from uh, you know, getting hit by anything or getting frayed so you don't have to worry about uh, any weak points in it. Um, and also on the right, that's our um, receiver, and that's uh, what I talked about earlier. It has the 3D gyro in it that allows us 3D flow. And this is another picture where we're getting our wire straight for our control system. We have to make sure that so we have the spinning components inside the helicopter here. We have to make sure all the wires were secured to where during flight nothing would get hit, where we would lose uh, you know, power from our service. There's a few videos here of uh, and 
And this is after we'd switched the blades out before we could actually get some better control on it. Better time management is stronger. 